In the previous video, I introduced function transformations, and I made the argument that you can really think about function transformations as just coming in four different types. There's two different types of vertical transformations, and there's two different types of horizontal transformations. So when you have a given transformation, maybe the first thing you want to figure out is whether that function transformation is vertical or if it's horizontal. When I say vertical, what I mean is your transformation is going to kind of change the y coordinates of the points on your graph. Loosely speaking, it's going to kind of move things up and down. Well, if you think about the y coordinates on your graph as being the outputs for your machine, right? When we plot a point, the input goes left and right and the output goes up and down. The fact that this graph goes through the point 2, 4 is because the input of 2 corresponds with an output of 4. Anyway, since the vertical or y coordinate corresponds with the output of the graph, it might not surprise you to hear that we have vertical transformations anytime we're messing with the output of the function. Whereas anytime we're messing with the input of the function, we have ourselves a horizontal transformation. And maybe you're thinking that's really vague in general. Can you make this a little bit more specific? Absolutely I can. If we look at this graph, y equals x squared, the x is the input and the x squared is the output. If you look at the transformations here, the numbers that we added to this equation to change it from this equation, y equals x squared, to our transformed function, there's a 5, a negative 3, a 2, and 11. The 5 and the negative 3 are affecting the x coordinate, not the x squared coordinate. What this function is doing is taking the input x and then multiplying it by 5 and then subtracting 3. All of those changes happen before the function squares that thing. So the 5 and the negative 3 are changing the input. These would be horizontal transformations. And then after the function squares that thing, we're thinking about the output of this function, y equals x squared. After the squaring, we're dividing by 2 and adding 11. It's the output of this function that we're dividing by 2 and we're adding 11 to. Therefore, this 2 and this 11 would both correspond with vertical transformations. What you'll see in this video and the next are that vertical transformations are the ones that kind of work out nicely, whereas the horizontal ones are the ones that are really tricky. In this video, we're going to be talking about vertical transformations, the kind of nice ones, the ones that you get by messing with the output of a function. Let me give you a better example. Somewhat counterintuitively, we're going to start with vertical transformations, but we're going to look at the addition and subtraction type first. So the type that I named up here type 2, and I'll explain why I gave it that name, is what we're going to look at in this first example. So this is a vertical transformation, but in my language, this is type 2 vertical transformations. The idea here is you start out with some graph, so h of x equals the square root of x in this case, and either you already know what this graph looks like, that it kind of has this shape, or you kind of create a table of values and you say because the square root of 0 is 0, this point at 0, 0 should be on the graph, and because the square root of 1 is 1, this point should be on the graph, and because the square root of 4 is 2, and the square root of 9 is 3, these points should be on my graph. What we want to know is what would the graph of y equals the square root of x plus 1 look like? And just to be clear, this is going to be very different from the graph of y equals the square root of x plus 1, which is not what we're looking at here. These might look really similar, but they're really different in terms of transformations. In this case, it's the square root of x that I'm adding 1 to, whereas in this case, it's the x that I'm adding 1 to. This would be a horizontal transformation, and we're not dealing with horizontal transformations. Right now, we're dealing with vertical transformations, so this is the graph that I want to explore. Well, there's two different ways you can think about it. What I think is easiest is just to recognize that in red, the y-coordinate is just the square root of x, but in blue, the y-coordinate is the square root of x plus 1. So all we're going to do is take all these different y-coordinates and add 1 to them. So this point that is currently at 0, 0 is going to move to 0, 1. This point that's currently at 1, 1 is going to move to 1, 2. This point that is currently at 4, 2 will move to 4, 3. And this point that is at 9, 3 will move up to 9, 4. I connect these dots with something that has roughly the same shape as what I see in red, and I get my transformed graph. That's it. If you ask somebody what just happened, most people when they look at red and blue would be like, oh yeah, the graph in blue is kind of shifted up by one unit. That's the verbiage that books use when they describe this transformation. And it may seem really nitpicky that I'm trying to differentiate between adding one to all the y coordinates and shifting the graph vertically up by one unit. But I think thinking about it the first way will be advantageous to thinking about it the second way. Maybe not for this specific type of transformation, but when we get into more complicated examples. So I'd encourage you to think about this as, since it's a vertical transformation, we're going to mess with the y coordinates. And since we're adding one here, we're going to add one to all the different y coordinates. It's that simple. If I asked you what the graph of y equals the square root of x minus 2 looked like, 
you might naively guess that, well, I bet I'm just going to take all these different y coordinates and subtract two from them. And if that's what you'd guessed, you'd be 100% right. This point currently has a y coordinate of 0. I want it to have a y coordinate of negative 2. Note that I'm not changing its x coordinate at all. It's not moving left and right, just up and down, because I'm only changing the y coordinate. This y coordinate is at positive 1. Positive 1 minus 2 is negative 1. This y coordinate is at 2. 2 minus 2 is 0. And this y coordinate is at 3. And 3 minus 2 is 1. I connect the dots and I get this graph in green. A lot of people in most books, if they were describing the graph in green relative to the graph in red, would say that the graph in green is shifted down two units, and while that's 100% true, I'd encourage you to think about it as, to create the graph in green, we're gonna subtract two from all the different y coordinates, as opposed to using verbs like shift. And But when I do the next example, hopefully it'll explain why I think that's advantageous. In the next example, I wanna stick with vertical transformations because that's all I'm gonna do in this video, but I wanna move on. Instead of talking about type two, I wanna talk about type one. So maybe you remember when we talk about vertical transformations, there's type two where we're adding and subtracting, but then there's also type one where we multiply and divide. Strange as it might seem, we're now ready to move on from type two to type one. So here's our type two example, here's our type one example. This time, instead of starting out with the graph of y equals the square root of x, I'm going to start out with the graph of y equals x squared, just to kind of mix up the starting points a little bit. What I want to come up with here is the graph of y equals 2 times x squared. And again, I want to be really careful here and emphasize that this is not the graph of y equals 2 times x squared. In this case, it's the x squared that I'm multiplying by 2. In this case, it's the x that I'm multiplying by 2. As you might be able to guess, this would have been a horizontal transformation. And we're not looking at horizontal transformations. We're looking at vertical transformations. So this is the transformation that I want to consider. Note that instead of adding or subtracting to the output of the function, this time we're multiplying the output of the function by 2. That's how we know it's this type 1 vertical transformation. So how do you apply this transformation? Well, it'd be kind of nice if we could use the same logic that we did up here. Since we're multiplying by two, maybe we'd think that we should just multiply all the old y values by two. And conveniently, that's exactly what you do. So look at some points on this graph. Here's four that fall at integer coordinates, so maybe it would be easiest to focus on these. If I think about this point that has an x coordinate of negative two and a y coordinate of four, and I take its y coordinate and multiply it by two, since four times two is eight, it should continue to have an x-coordinate of negative two, but its y-coordinate is now gonna be positive eight, so way up here. Similarly, this point has a y-coordinate of one, one times two is two. This point has a y-coordinate of zero, zero times two is still zero. This point has a y-coordinate of one, one times two is two, and this point has a y-coordinate of four, and four times two is eight. If I connect these new purple dots, with something that has roughly the same shape as what I see in green here, I end up with the transformed graph. Most books would tell you that what you just did is you stretched this graph vertically by a factor of two, but I'm gonna argue that it's better to think about it as I multiplied all the old y coordinates by two. And you probably still don't see the advantage of thinking about it this way instead of this way, but I think with my next example, I'll finally be able to illustrate that. What if we wanna know what the graph of y equals negative one half x squared looks like? And again, just to really emphasize the difference between vertical and horizontal transformations, this is not the graph of y equals negative one-half x squared. It's not the x coordinate that I'm multiplying by negative one-half. It's the x squared, the output of this machine, that I'm multiplying by negative one-half. Well, really all I'm doing is I'm changing this two into this negative one-half. So it makes a lot of sense to think that instead of multiplying the y coordinates by two, I'm just gonna multiply all the old y coordinates by negative one-half. And that's 100% true, that's what we're gonna do. This y coordinate used to be positive four. Four times negative one half is negative two. So it's gonna end up down here. This y coordinate used to be one. One times negative a half is negative a half. Zero times negative a half. One times negative a half. Four times negative a half. I end up with dots at all of these points. And if I connect the dots with something that has more or less the same shape as what I started out with in green, I get this graph. And you're like, yeah, that wasn't really harder than purple. Like pink and purple were really the same thing. Just instead of multiplying all the old y coordinates by two, now I'm multiplying all the y coordinates by negative one half. Yeah, I totally agree. However, this is where it's advantageous to think about it this way, instead of thinking about it in terms of verbs like you see up here. Because imagine how you would describe what just happened to get from the green graph to the graph in pink. What a book would tell you is we're gonna reflect this graph over the x-axis and then we're gonna kind of squish the graph up towards the x-axis, compress it vertically by a factor of two. 
And that's entirely true. I mean, that is how you get the graph in pink out of the graph in green. There's sort of two steps. You reflect it vertically, and then you compress it, squeeze it up by a factor of two. But if you're using these verbs, then really we've th seen three different types of transformations on this page. Sometimes we're stretching vertically, sometimes we're compressing vertically, and sometimes we're reflecting vertically. And that gets really complicated keeping straight what you're doing. It makes it look like there's a lot more types of transformations than really they are. If you don't think about it in terms of these verbs, but instead just think about all we're doing is multiplying the y coordinate by, instead of two, negative one half, then purple and pink are really the same thing, which is why I call them both type one. The big summary here is that when we're talking about vertical transformations, there's really only two types, type two and type one. You can recognize that it's a vertical transformation because we're messing with the output, so the square root of x, or x squared, as opposed to messing with the input, the x coordinate. Once you can tell that it's a vertical transformation, it's up to you to figure out whether it's type one or type two, but that's easy enough also. It's type two if you're adding or subtracting, it's type one if you're multiplying or dividing. So the fact that I'm adding one here tells me that it's type two. The fact that I'm multiplying by two or negative one half here tells me that it's type one. One final case to consider before I call this video good. What if you had both type one and type two vertical transformations within the same problem? So let's go back to this h of x equals the square root of x example. Let me try to make this as hard as possible. Let me ask you what the graph of y equals negative one half square root of x plus one looks like. What most books would tell you is there's some reflection going on, there's some compression going on, and there's some shifting going on. But I'd encourage you to think about this as there's a type two vertical transformation and a type one vertical transformation. The type one vertical transformation tells me that I'm gonna multiply the y's by negative one half. And that comes from this negative one half right here. The type two vertical transformation comes from this positive one, and that tells me that I need to add one to the y coordinates. Does it matter which order you do things in? Like if I added one first and then multiplied by negative one half, would I get the same answer as if I multiplied by negative one half and then added one? It turns out no, you would not get the same answer. And yes, it is very important the order that you do these in. So what order should we do them in? Well, based on the naming convention, you might guess that with vertical transformations, you need to do type one before type two. What does that look like? Well, think about this point right here. It has a y coordinate of zero. My type one transformation says I should multiply that by negative one half. So zero times negative one half is still zero. And then my type two transformation says I should take that answer, zero, and add one to it. So that moves this point up here to one. Consider for a second doing these in the other order. If I had started at this point of zero and tried to do my type two transformation, I'd be adding one to it and come up here. And then if I multiplied it by negative one half, because one times negative one half is negative one half, it would have moved down here. So when I do type one before type two, I end up up here with the y coordinate of one, but when I do type two before type one, I end up down here with the y coordinate of negative one half. Because we end up at different points, it's really important the order you do them in, which is why I specify do type one before type two. This point should end up up here at positive one and not down here at negative one half. To make sure that made sense, let's repeat it a couple more times. I start out here with a point that has a y coordinate of one, not because of this one, but because of this one. My type one transformation says that I need to multiply that value by negative one half. So one times negative one half brings me down here to negative one half. But now I'm not done, I still have to do my type two transformation, which says add one to that y coordinate. So one more than negative one half brings me up here to positive one half. We're kind of taking this journey down here and then up here to end up with this as our ending point. That's really hard. Let's do a couple more points to really make that sink in. This point starts out with the y coordinate of two. The first thing I wanna do is multiply that by negative one half. Two times negative one half is negative one. That brings the point down here, but this point is not on my graph. This is just kind of an intermediate step because this is what I get after doing my type one transformation. I still have to do my type two transformation. I have to take this y coordinate of negative one and add one to it, which brings it up here to zero. This point right here is gonna be on the graph of y equals negative one half x plus one. One more, this point starts out with the y coordinate of three. Three times negative one half is negative three halves or negative one and a half. And negative three halves plus one more is negative one half. This point here should end up on my final graph. 
I wish I had color coordinated this a little bit better. These big green dots are gonna end up on my final graph. So I'll connect them with something that has roughly the same shape as what I started out with in red. And I get my final graph, y equals negative 1 half times the square root of x plus 1. That's everything you need for vertical transformations. But since I know that transformations tend to be really hard with students, here's one more example that you can kind of practice on your own. We start out with the graph, which is pictured in orange here. And what we want to know is what would the graph of negative 2 times the absolute value of x plus 3 look like? You might want to pause and do this on your own. I'll write the answers up in front of you. 